Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone round his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be removed and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Suppose one of you had a servant ploughing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you are told to do, you should say, we are only unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. If you look at the structure of the chapter here, you find here this sense that as I say, there's a slight strangeness to the structure of the chapter. Jesus starts off by talking about sin. And he says, sin will always come. It's the way the world is. There'll always be those who cause sin and who lead others into sin. And that's, that's the way the world is. But woe to the person through whom it comes. So what he's saying is that sin is a part of the way the world is. There'll always be that, that wrongdoing and that leading into sin. But people have got personal responsibility. You can't pass it on to somebody else. Uh, you take responsibility for your own sin. And then he says, watch yourselves. But the warning he gives them doesn't seem to follow that because he doesn't say, so watch yourselves that you don't sin. He says, watch the way you respond to sin. He talks about what we should do when people do sin. And so it seems that his concern wasn't with whether they would sin or not, but how they would judge others who sinned. And I think there's a great relevance to that because we as disciples of Jesus have been given power over sin. We know that we still sin, we're still faulty human beings, but we don't live in that old way that we read about in Ephesians at the beginning of the, um, the service. We're, we're set free from that. So we know that we are actually better than people around us. So we don't live like people in this world and we know that actually there are ways in which we're better than they are. Not because of what we are in ourselves, but because of God's grace in our lives. And the difficulty we sometimes have is because of that, it's easier for us to fall into the trap of condemning people. So when we see people do things that are wrong, we say, oh, that's terrible, look what they've done. And we tend to judge people and look down on them and rebuke them. And especially if they keep on sinning against us repeatedly, it's sometimes hard then to, to forgive them. And so when he says, watch yourselves, he's not just simply saying, watch that you don't sin like this. His warning is that they are able to keep on forgiving those who sin against them. 
And so he gives exactly what we should do. So if your brother sins, don't condemn him, rebuke him. There's a difference. To rebuke him means to tell him what his fault is. To condemn him is to stand back in judgment and say, he's, he's just lost, he's just dead, he's just, he's just you know, terrible in the things he's done there. And to sit like a judge on a bench. To rebuke him is to get involved and to say, this is why you're wrong. And to help him then to come back to the right place. And if he sins against you and asks for forgiveness, and this is, this is why they ask, I think, for faith, because if it's seven times in a day, it's not just seven times as you find elsewhere in scripture, but in a single day, seven times he sins against you and hurts you and grieves you and comes back and says, I repent, forgive me. Seven times in a day, in other words, endless forgiveness, perfect forgiveness, you keep on forgiving. And that's how Jesus tells us to deal with those who sin against us. So that's how it all starts. And so that brings us to the need for faith because their response to that is, Lord, increase our faith. It's a strange thing to say, really, in response to what he's just told them. But they've understood something, that they can't do this in their own strength and that the need they've got is for faith. Why that? Why not, Lord, increase our patience or increase our love or our grace or whatever that will help us to forgive? It's, Lord, increase our faith. Well, I think the answer helps, or the, the way that helps us is to think about Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, where it says there, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because those who come to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And literally, the translation there is, those who come to him must believe that he is. Which reminds me of that Old Testament phrase that God himself used, where he says, he, where he says I am that I am. I am. I'm eternal and unchanging, and, and I will always be what I am at this moment. I never change, I never alter, but I'm always there in every situation, unchanging, unfailing, unalterable, the God who is almighty, the God who is above all. And what these disciples are recognizing is something of that, that they've got to understand their right relationship with God in order to have a right relationship with men. And we need to have that understanding. If you want to get on with people in this gracious, loving way, you've got to first of all get right with God, because you'll never do it any other way. But if you know how great God is and how holy God is and how he sees every one of your sins and every one of your failures and doesn't condemn you but does rebuke you and say you have sinned and brings conviction, but also in his grace brings us Jesus and his love for us and brings us forgiveness. If we understand how much we are forgiven, if we understand how much we have offended God and yet how much God loves us, then in that relationship of faith, we can then say to others, I forgive you. And it's the only way to do it. So the disciples were right in saying, increase our faith. They understood that the, the answer to this was faith. The answer to this was relationship with God. That God who is God who is unchanging and unfailing, God who never alters his standards but never alters his love towards us, will enable us to live a life that is worthy of his calling. And so they understood this need for faith. And Hebrews 11 also tells us something else that relates to this chapter, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. For a little later in the chapter, these ten lepers come along and they come in faith. They call Jesus Master, they recognize his Lordship, and they say, have mercy on us, take pity on us. And when he says, go and show yourselves to the priests, they understood what he's saying there, because what he's saying is, they had to be declared clean by the priests. So if they believe him, they will go and trust him, and when they get to the priests, they'll then be able to be declared clean by the priests, because the work will be done. So they go on their way, and as they go, they are healed. But at the end of it all, Jesus says to the one who comes back, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has saved you, basically. So the faith 
enabled him to be rewarded by God. This man came back rejoicing because he knew that God had rewarded his faith. And so faith is those two things. It helps us know that God is real, that God is who he says he is, and that God rewards those who come to him in that faith. And so we understand the need for faith in this chapter. And we, I'm sure, can say with the disciples, Lord, increase our faith. But what happens next is quite strange because usually when people make a request of Jesus in faith, he does what they ask. So the lepers, when they come and ask him to heal them, they're healed. And elsewhere, when the disciples come to Jesus and say, Lord, for example, explain this parable to us, he does that. When they come to him and say, Lord, teach us to pray, he does that. But here they come and say, Lord, increase our faith, which seems like a very good request to make. And yet he doesn't seem to answer their request, at least at first glance. In fact, if anything, he seems to almost rebuke them. Because he says, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, and then tells a parable about servants just getting on with the job. So it almost is like, almost like a rebuke, he reproves them. So how does he answer their request? Well, I think he tells them two key things. In what he tells them, I think he does answer their request, but not in the way they want him to. Wouldn't it be great if we could just ask God to do something for us and he just did what we wanted? You know, like a magic wand, like a divine slot machine, you put your request in and out comes the answer. We love to have God do things like that, wouldn't we? And sometimes God in his grace does, but very often he doesn't. And wouldn't it be great if we just came to God and said, because I've often felt this myself. You know, I know a Chris Rice song, about the, he says, if I had a magic wand, I'd wave it over all this crazy world and make it right. And he says, he looks at his own life and thinks, wouldn't it be great if I could just wave a magic wand and make my life perfect? Because what happens when we become a Christian is that we then have these two natures struggling. We have a new nature given to us. God gives us his own nature. He puts something of his own spirit within us. And so we have this desire to do right. We have this knowledge of what we should be doing. We have a God-given purpose to serve Jesus all our days. And we want to do that. And yet, like Paul, we say, I want to do what is right, and yet evil is always present with me. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And we're conscious that all the time we're struggling with this, this old human nature of ours. It is constantly pulling us down. And wouldn't it be great if we had a magic wand to wave over our lives and suddenly become perfect super Christians? I would love that if I could have one act of grace in my life that just changed me forever and made me perfectly like Jesus. It doesn't work that way. We're changed from glory into glory into that same image. There is a process going on there. But it's done by our self-denial. We've been reminded again, the cross comes before the crown. One day you will be like Jesus. He's reminded us that we will be to the praise of his glory. We'll exist to glorify God forever. But not until that day comes when Jesus returns or calls us to himself. Until then we go on with this battle and we just wish we could be better. We just wish we could increase our faith. We just wish we could do more for Jesus. But in the end, it comes down to us doing what Jesus tells us. And so Jesus tells the disciples what they need to know to increase their faith. He actually says, you don't need very much. So often we wait for things to be perfect before we act. When we've, got it, when we've got really strong faith, when we've got it all sorted out, when we've got our problems behind us, then we'll do great things for Jesus. That's not the way it works. Just do what you can now. Just do the little things and trust the Lord for the rest, because it's all you need. The first thing Jesus says is, faith is like a seed. So if you had faith like a seed of mustard, 
You could say to this mulberry tree, you'd be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would go, it would do it. Elsewhere, he talks about mountains being removed by faith, by faith as small as a mustard seed. The picture on the screen there is, is the mustard shrub that grows in, in, in Israel. A tiny, tiny seed, it's like dust. You can hardly see it, but you plant it and it grows into a large shrub. In ideal conditions, apparently, it grows 10 feet tall. And I like the idea of faith as a seed. Firstly, because something so small has such a massive effect. And the other parables that Jesus uses have this similar idea. A little tiny bit of yeast you put into a whole batch of dough and it works the whole dough and has a huge effect. Like a seed planted in the ground that grows into something marvellous. It's such a small thing and it has such a powerful effect because faith touches God. Faith is seeing what God sees. Faith is taking God at his word, like John's definition. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That is what faith is about. It's about just simply taking God at his word and believing him. And when you do that, you tap into his resources so that what is impossible becomes possible. And so this need to forgive that is impossible in our strength becomes possible because God's grace is poured into our lives. And even mountains can be removed and, it, and miracles can happen because faith makes those things possible. But I also like the idea of a seed because the point is that seeds grow. Seeds have to be planted for that to happen. I've got a box full of seeds at home. They will never grow unless I plant them. And God is calling us to plant the seed. The truth of God's word is there for us. The spirit of God is at work in our lives. But if we never put those things together and actually do what it says, we'll never get the answer. You've got to plant the seed. But seed is something that grows. And I believe God intends faith to grow in our lives and the outcome of faith to grow in our experience and the reality of God's greatness to grow in what we do and what we say. So we can experience the reality of God in our lives increasingly as we learn to put our trust in him and do what he says. So faith is like a seed. You don't need much to get results, but it will grow, it will develop, and we can see and learn more. And I hope you've got the, the experience I've had. You start off with very small faith, but as you see God answer prayer, and as you see God being faithful, you learn to trust him more, and to step out that bit, little bit more boldly, and to expect that little bit more from God, and to do that bit more for God, because you're growing. As faith grows, you grow. Your experience of God grows. And so there's a sense that it does increase and faith can become stronger as we go through our experience in our life with God. So faith is like a seed. And then the other thing is this, that faith also is then spoken of in relation to action. James tells us that faith that works is dead. So it's again like the seed in the box. If you don't do anything about it, you'll never see the outcome. If you don't do what God says, you'll never see his, his responses and his actions and his work in your life. So the second parable Jesus tells, and the second comparison is like a servant. It says when you're doing, you know, you're like servants, you've got to do what the master says. And you've got to keep on doing it. So it's not just doing one job and then expecting God to reward you. He says, the servant goes out, and he's talking here about bond slaves. So this isn't just you know, a servant who can please himself, who can choose his master. This is somebody who's owned, somebody who belongs to a master. And he goes out and he plows, and he looks after the sheep, and then he comes in. So he's worked hard all day. And he says, but then, when he comes in, he doesn't get a chance to sit down and, and take it easy. He's got to carry on working. He's now got to prepare food and wait on the master. And only after all that is finished does he get a chance to sit down and get his reward and get the food that the master provides for him. And at the end of it all, even that is not something they've earned by their walk. It's still given to them by the master. 
At the end of it all, they should say, we are only servants. We have only done our duty. We're unworthy. So we never deserve anything from the master. It's all what we should be doing and what he gives us in response is grace, not merit. And that's a real challenge to us because sometimes we do feel, if I do this for God, God will answer my prayers. I've heard numerous stories of people who've done that or they'll, or they'll work hard for God and they'll try and their very best to, to, to please God and to serve God in the hope that then they can pray for something and receive an answer. And there's a sense of bargaining with God and expecting to earn something from God. But Jesus tells us we're always at best just unworthy servants and anything God gives us is grace. So get on with it is what he says. Don't wait for God to give you this magic wand to make it all work. Just do what you're told. The word of God is there for us. The principles of God, what God intends us to do in our lives are laid out for us. Get on with it. Do what you are told to do. You are only unworthy servants. All you can do is serve. That's all we can do. Just serve the Lord as best we can with whatever he gives us to do. And that could be being a housewife or being a worker in office or being a parent. There's all kinds of ways of serving. But whatever God gives you to do, just do it with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Just do it all as service. Everything we do is service. And if we see it as such and see it as doing it to please God, that's being what Jesus called us to be active servants. Because then at the end of it all, God does give us the reward. At the end of the day, the servants are fed. The servants are given what the master provides for them. And so we're called to suffer for Jesus, but with that knowledge that the certainty of glory is there and the security of God's provision for our lives but also the knowledge that the master will always give us what we need. The master will provide the tools. The master will give us the seeds. The master will feed us day by day to give us strength for each day. All we need, as we've sung today, all I need is in you. And so we come to then understand that we live by faith. It's not that God waves a magic wand over our lives and gives us perfect faith and then we just, then we go and do what we should do. We just learn, learn to live by faith. It's a bit like a muscle. You know, we've all got muscles. Some of us are stronger than others. And I know the ones who are strongest here are the ones who do most work because that's the way we strengthen our muscles. I don't know if any of you ever go to the gym. I don't see any obvious candidates for that. And some who are probably clearly not, but I'll not point at, it, point at anybody, myself included actually. So, so we know that we, we could be fitter than we are. We've got to work the muscles to build them. But, but if you work, if you are diligent and, 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 and work hard at something, you'll become stronger and faith the same. If you work at it, you become stronger. If you do what Jesus says, you get better at it because it's his work in your life. It's through faith that we live. We walk by faith and not by sight. And that's how Jesus calls us to live. And then at the end of it all, having said, Lord, increase our faith, and he seemingly hasn't done, they then witness what happens when you act in faith. Ten lepers come along and they call out, have mercy on us. And he says, go. And so they don't see the miracle. They see ten men walk off and Luke records for us, as they go, they are healed. And there's something in this, as you go, you are healed. It's as you go, you experience the results of faith. It's as you go, you find God's work in your life. If you sit there waiting for the work to happen first, it never will. If the lepers had stayed there saying, no, no, Lord, heal us, just, just do the work first, then we'll go and show ourselves, and didn't act in faith, I guess they'd never been healed. But they went because they believed that what Jesus said was enough. 
They went in faith and as they went, they were healed. As we go, we are healed. As we go, we find the results of faith. But one comes back praising God. And Jesus says, weren't all ten healed? Where are they the nine? He knows because he knows what God's doing. He knows how God works. He knows all ten were healed at his word because they responded in faith. And he commends the man and says, your faith has made you whole. And so the disciples see how it works. And so actually, although there's no magic wand that waves over them, that increases their faith, Jesus gives them the chance to learn the lessons so they can increase their faith. And that's how we learn the lessons as well. Not by waiting for God to work some miraculous change in our lives, but by step by step doing what he gives us to do and understanding it's only small. Our faith is so small, but it's enough to move mountains and it will grow as we plant it, as we operate in faith. And as we do what he gives us to do, God will work in us and through us. And even miracles are possible as we operate in faith. And so we can see then, at the end of it all, these two things to remember, that faith is like a seed. It grows if you nurture it. And faith is like a muscle. It grows as you exercise it. And so I can't promise you a magic wand. I can't say, come forward, let me pray for you, and you'll receive miraculous faith. But I can say, just do what God gives you to do and he will always be faithful to you and he will help you grow and he will help you understand and he will help you live out his life and he will help you find his ways and his works in your life. Amen.